Praise the Lord. Are you there? I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight. And I pray that the Bible study tonight will do you good. It will do your family good. And do our church good in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Bible study. We're thanking you tonight because of the rich word you're giving to us. We're asking, oh Lord, that your word will unite families, will unite the church, and unite every one of us to the body of Christ in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you open the pages of the scriptures to every one of us tonight. And will behold wondrous, wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. Bless us through the word. And use us to bless other people around us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're studying from Mark chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 22, Mark chapter 3, verse 22. And his Christ, which came down from Jerusalem, said, He has Beelzebub, and a priest by the priests of the devils, casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them, in, in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? And if the kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. That's part of what we are looking at today. But that gives us the title of the subject we're looking at today. The self-destruction of a divided kingdom. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. That divided kingdom will fall. It will be an end to that kingdom. It will destroy itself. The self-destruction of a divided kingdom. A divided kingdom destroys itself because it's fighting against itself. Instead of that kingdom fighting against a common enemy, that kingdom turns the sword and the skill they have on one another. And because of that, that kingdom is destroyed. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Let's read verse 1. In verse 1 we're told, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And then Jehoshaphat went to pray. Look at the final result in verse 23. Remember, the children of Ammon and Moab, all of them united together. We're going to fight a common enemy. When he got to the battlefield in verse 23, for the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. Instead of fighting the enemy, they fought themselves. And they destroyed themselves. And that brings us back to Mark chapter 3. What Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand, will not stand. 
a community divided against itself cannot stand, will not stand. There will be self-destruction for that community, a tribe divided against itself. All of a sudden, members of that tribe, the citizens of, those, of that tribe, instead of fighting a common enemy, they begin to fight themselves. That tribe will come to an end. That tribe cannot stand. A family, husband, wife, and children divided against itself. The wife fighting the husband. The husband fighting the wife. That family cannot stand. It's a principle that cuts across dispensations and ages. And now we come to the church. A church divided, fighting against itself, drawing the sword and using their skills to fight against each other. That household of faith, that church, that community and assembly of believers will not stand. Let's come back to Mark chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 24 and verse 25. If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. That kingdom will be destroyed. And in verse 25, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Your house will stand. Your family will stand. Our church will stand. If a family is going to stand, there'll be unity. There'll be togetherness. You have the same goal. You have the same ideal. You have the same vision. You have the same destination. And you're walking hand in hand, united, so that you reach that destination. But once you become divided, and you're using your intelligence to fight each other. You're using your skill to fight one another. You're using your education to fight one another. You're using your power, your strength to fight one another. That family will come to an end. That church will come to an end. And that community will come to an end. Look at that verse 25 again. It says, and if a house, these are the words of Jesus, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Will your house stand? I said, will your family stand? Then you must be united. You must be together. You mustn't use any skill, any knowledge, any understanding, any behavior, any instrument to fight one another. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 30. Here is a house, here is a family, here is a father and a son. Look at what happens here. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, reading from verse 30, it says in verse 30, then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. Saul, the father, Jonathan, the son. Anywhere there's anger, either from the father to the son, from the mother to the daughter, anywhere there's anger, in any family, that anger is what perpetrates or propels action. That kind of anger is like fighting against each other in the family. That family cannot stand. And if it's a church where pastors are angry against the members of the church, where ministers are angry against each other, because that church is divided, that church cannot stand. Come back to Bastaji. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman. That's his own wife. He's calling her perverse, rebellious woman. Anger does not understand good language, good disposition, 
good action, anger will destroy the family. It says, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? Look at that. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered, saw his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What has he done? You can see that the father and the mother didn't have the same understanding and the same decision about David. They were divided. One is saying he must die. The other one is saying, no, he will not die. What has he done? Why are you fighting him? Why are you going against him? A house divided against itself. Look at what happens now in verse 33. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. The javelin in his hand. He was the king. It was to use that javelin to strike at the enemy. And you understand, when, when um, Goliath threw up fighting against Israel, he was, ship, he was shivering. He couldn't use that javelin against uh, Goliath, but now he's using that javelin against his own son. A house divided against itself cannot stand, will not stand. And the same thing upon scene. Every company, you're working somewhere. In that place where you're working, the director, the manager, and all the other people who are working there, from the messenger to the top-level workers, there must be unity if they're going to make progress because a company divided against itself, an office divided against itself, any community of people divided against themselves will not stand. And that's why we need to understand a divided house knows no peace. There'll, no, there'll be no peace in a divided house, in a divided community, in a divided tribe, if we're going to have peace in the community, peace in the church, and peace in the tribe, and peace in any nation, we must come together. And all the opposing factors, and all the opposing ideas, everything should be regularized so that we can move on in unity. A divided house knows no progress. If there's going to be progress in the house, and progress in the church, and progress in the community, there must be unity. Because once we're divided, then we cannot move forward. A divided church knows no purity. There'll be no peace, there'll be no progress, there'll be no purity once the church is divided, once the family is divided, once the assembly of saints, that assembly is divided, there'll be no peace, there'll be no progress, there'll be no purity. And you understand? Without purity, you cannot get to heaven. And if we're divided and there's no peace, we're divided, we cannot find a peacemaker in the church in the assembly, in the fellowship, in the family that will unite us together. The divided church, divided assembly is uh, heading towards perdition. I pray that we'll not get to perdition. Somebody there is saying we'll not get to perdition. Unity is the strength of anyone. Unity is the strength of any family. Unity is the strength of any church. Unity is the strength of any community. Let's come back to Mark chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the priests of the devils casteth he out devils. They were talking about their savior. 
about their Messiah, about the Son of God, about the one that the Almighty God has sent to save them. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. The Savior, having loved the Savior, wanting to save them, the Savior, wanting to get them out of the way of perdition and bring them to the way of heaven. They said he has the devil. He's casting out devils by Beelzebub. With that statement, they will not go to him as Savior. They will not receive him as Savior. They looked down on him. They belittled him and they insulted him because they didn't want him to be their Savior and their Lord. Once anybody gets to that position, he's resisting the Word of God, he's resisting the Messiah, the Christ, he's receiving the one that can lead him to life eternal. How can he be saved? I pray that kind of spirit, spirit of division in any heart, everything will be cleared away in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. The self-destruction of a divided kingdom. Three parts uh, we're looking at today. Number one, the unpreventable self-destruction of deluded deceivers. These were deceivers because they knew, they knew better than what they were saying. They said Jesus was casting out devils by evil spirits and by devils. They deceived themselves. They deluded themselves and they couldn't prevent their self-destruction. That's why Jesus said an unpre there is an unpreventable self-destruction for those deluded deceivers. Point number two, the unpardonable sin of degenerate despisers. They despised him and they despised the spirit, the Holy Ghost, by which he cast out devils and Jesus told them be careful that's treading a dangerous path and you'll have uh, to pay for that look at verse 28 verily I say unto you all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith so ever they shall blaspheme verse 29 but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation because the sage he has an unclean spirit. Point number two, the unpardonable sin of degenerate despisers. They despised him. They were degenerate. They were unsaved. They were sinners. They knew that Jesus Christ was casting out devils by the power of God, by the Holy Ghost. But he turned it around and he said it was an evil spirit walking in, in him. And Jesus warned them of the unpardonable sin, the unpardonable sin of degenerate despisers. Point number three, the unprecedented status of dedicated disciples they were disciples even though the pharisees were there and they were saying the wrong thing and they were contradicting themselves but these disciples were devoted decisive dedicated unto the lord and jesus mentioned about their unprecedented status let's look at chapter 3 of mark i'm reading from verse 31 there came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without saint unto him, calling him, and the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about on them which sat about him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, 
For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. The status of those decisive disciples. The status of those dedicated disciples. The status of those devoted disciples. Point number three, the unprecedented status of dedicated disciples. We're coming back to point number one. The unpreventable self-destruction of deluded deceivers. Come to chapter 3 of Mark and see what happened here. As the Lord was doing the will of the Father, healing the sick, casting out devils, saving the lost, and seeking for sinners to repent. Then the only comment these Pharisees will pass is that the sh people should not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because he said he was doing that by the power of Satan. Mark chapter 3 verse 23. And he called unto them and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? How can Satan cast out Satan? And if the kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if the house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself, if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but has an end. If Satan rises up against himself, then he cannot stand. He has an age. His kingdom has an age. His ideas and everything he wants to do, everything has an age. Verse 27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. From what we have read, and I've commented on that already, that a man, if a man is divided against himself, so how can that happen? The brain, the head, controls members of the body. If the head tells the hand to move, and the hand rebels against the head, and the legs rebel against the head, and the ears rebel against the head when members of the body rebel against the head. That's what we call insanity. He destroys his purpose for living because that individual is rebelling against itself. What happens to a man is what happens to a family. If a family is divided against itself, that family will lose focus. That family will open the door for the enemy to destroy. That family will pull down the roof upon itself and will come to desolation. Take our nation. If a nation is divided against itself, against the Messiah, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, they were divided against the Messiah. And then they became blind and they perished in self-imposed darkness. When the church also follows the way and the path of religious Israel, and the church is divided against itself, that church is on the downward road to destruction, to doom, and to damnation. And look at, let me uh, read to you something here again. Uh, verse 20, verse uh, 22. And the scribes uh, which came down from Jerusalem said, Yes, Beelzebub. And by the prince of the devils, casteth ye out devils. The new better. The new better. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 2. In John chapter 3, let's back up to verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, Master, 
we know not just i know but we know that thou art a teacher come from god look at that one of them a pharisee and a ruler among the pharisees said we know thou art a teacher come from god for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except god be with him they knew and yet they deluded themselves and deceived themselves and said he was casting out devils by Beelzebub. Look at John chapter 11. John 11, I'm reading from verse 47. John 11 verse 47, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees, a council, and said, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles you see that they knew it was the power of god they knew it was by the holy ghost and they said what are we doing this man referring to jesus do it many miracles if we let him thus alone all men will believe on him that tells you the reason why they were saying he was casting out devils by beelzebub because they said we're going to lose our religion we're going to lose her position. We're going to lose a sacred place. If he continues working miracles, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place, our place, our position, and nation. They were fighting for a place, a position here on earth. They were not interested in a place, a position in heaven. And one of them named Caiaphas being the high priest that same year said unto them you know nothing at all he said you don't know i have a plan you don't know i have something in my heart we're going to do to him we'll get rid of him if we use bad language and that doesn't work if we use a kind of blasphemous language and it doesn't work we'll use another thing all we want to do is get rid of him. We're telling the public now that he has Beelzebub, he has devils, and the, de uh, the public hears us, then the public will not follow after him. But if they keep on following after him, and bad language does not work, then we'll do another thing. What were they going to do? Verse 50, now consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perished not and they spake he not of himself but being the high priest that year he prophesied that jesus should die for that nation that shows you then their hatred that shows you their intention that they said he had evil spirit they themselves did not even believe themselves John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 10. John chapter 12, we're reading from verse 10. But the chief, but the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death because of the raising up of Lazarus from the dead. And he knew he did that by the power of God. And the people were wondering, is this not the Christ? He's done what no other person has ever done. It's not this, the Messiah. He has done what's, what no other person has ever done. Is this not the Savior? And because of Lazarus, many people went and believed on the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 11. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. All the bad comments... And all the erroneous comments of the Pharisees did not stop them from believing the bad comments of anybody, anywhere, on any area will not stop you from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus. I said I believe in Jesus. Is my Savior. Say it aloud, is my Savior. Say it aloud, is my Lord. Believe in the Lord. Whatever people say, 
and whatever people write and whatever people project you understand like the pharisees they're doing that in their own uh, area at their own level when they said yes beelzebub yes the master of satan they didn't believe it themselves they said that in blasphemous words so that they'll stop the people from believing nobody will stop you from believing look at john chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 18 john chapter 12 we're reading from verse 18 for this cause the people also met him for that they had heard that he had done this miracle the pharisees therefore said among themselves perceive ye how ye prevail nothing perceive ye how the bad language the blasphemous language is not accomplishing anything perceive ye how ye prevail nothing behold tell me behold say it aloud the world is gone after him that was their challenge that was their uh, kind of grievance that the world is going after him and believing on him i pray that comments of people writings of people wherever they put uh, that writing will not lead you astray you believe on the lord jesus christ you believe the Bible, you believe the Word of God, and you believe everything the Lord is revealing to us that Jesus is Savior, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Master. If you are not saved yet, you'll give your life to the Lord, you'll be saved in Jesus' name. If you are saved already, no comment of anyone coming from any quarter will hinder you from making progress in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Come to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 34. Matthew chapter 9, verse 34. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages. Look at that. In verse 34, they had the insulting language and the blasphemous language. In verse 35, Jesus did not allow that to stop him. He will not stop you. He did not allow that to hinder him from doing what the Father had called him to do, sent him to do. They will not hinder you in Jesus' name. They will not hinder me. I said they will not hinder me. I'm talking for myself. They will not hinder me. Your evangelism, they will not end hinder. Your soul winning, they will not hinder. The work of God in your hand, their bad comments will not hinder you in Jesus' name. Verse 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness look at that they said it was healing with uh, you know the power of satan but that will not stop the healing ministry and that will not stop his deliverance ministry and every disease among the people but when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad a sheep having uh, no shepherd then said he unto his disciples, Truly, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Then in verse 38, Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that ye will send forth laborers into his harvest field. I pray that the work the Lord had committed into our hands, we will do you will do and nothing will stop us in jesus name remember once again the principle the lord is showing us and he wants us to take it to heart that a house divided against itself cannot stand a church divided against itself cannot stand a family divided against itself cannot stand second samuel chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 6 second samuel chapter 15 we're reading from verse 6 
And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Here we're looking at the family of David. David had sons and daughters, and uh, there was division in that family. Amnon had done something to Tamar. And because of that, Absalom arranged, organized for his death, and he was killed. And then Absalom ro uh, ran away. He went to exile. But there was somebody that was campaigning and uh, pleading for Absalom. Eventually, Absalom came back. And when Absalom came back, instead of appreciating the father for the mercy, appreciating the father for the love, he decided he was going to topple the reign of David. And you, you know the story. He'll be talking, if I were there, everything would be all right. If they made me the leader, everything would be all right. If they made me the deputy to the king, everything would be all right. And he stole the hearts of the people. That's telling us that house was divided. Look at verse 7. And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom, say, Absalom said to the king, uh, talking to the king David, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vouched unto the Lord in Hebron, and for thy servant vouch a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. You know, this is almost near blasphemy. He was planning something terrible. He was planning something horrific. And yet he said, he was going to serve the Lord. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. And he arose and went to Hebron. Verse 10, But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom went two hundred men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. They knew not anything. That was the division in the household of David. He brought a war, a civil war. Eventually, Absalom died and did he go to heaven? Where did he go? Hell. He went to hell. He walked against himself. He brought division to the kingdom of David. He brought division to the uh, kingdom of his father. We will not do that. You will not do that. We'll be united in our church in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 1. In First Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing teach the same doctrine and that there be no divisions among you why because a divided family will fall why because a divided kingdom will destroy itself why because a divided church will destroy itself it says that she all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you and that she be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I pray God will grant us unity. You'll be an agent of unity. And you'll be a person, a warrior for unity in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the unpardonable sin of the generic despisers. These Pharisees, these priests, what despises? They were degenerate. They didn't have the Spirit of God. They didn't have regeneration. They didn't have salvation. 
and in their lostness, in their sinfulness, they now were committing the unpardonable sin. Let's come to Mark chapter 3. I read from verse 28. Mark chapter 3, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they blaspheme. That is all the sins we have committed in ignorance in our past life. I will say whatever was said without any understanding and without knowing the truth was seen with the hand, was seen with the feet, was seen with the mouth, was seen with our understanding, with our intelligence. And the Lord said, If you recognize him as Savior, recognize him as Lord, and you call upon him in repentance, you'll be forgiven. And if you are not saved today, I pray that after this uh, Bible study, salvation will come to you in Jesus' name. Our God is a merciful God. It's a pardoning God. It's a forgiving God. It's a loving God. He loves everyone. And whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You will not be lost in Jesus' name. Verse 29. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Damnation eternal. That's hellfire. And in hellfire, people don't go there. And then after 10 years, come out. After 100 years, come out. After 1,000 years, come out. Hellfire is forever and ever. Damnation, perdition, torment, suffering in hellfire is forever and ever. And if people knew the gravity of the unpardonable sin, they will change and they will understand that once they persist in that kind of evil, if they went to hell, it will be forever and ever. And thank God I am not going to hell. I said, thank God I'm not going to hell. You will not go to hell. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation because they said... He has an unclean spirit. Let me explain this to you. Everyone who comes to God through Jesus Christ in genuine repentance and faith will be saved. A Pharisee, a Sadducee, a scribe, a pagan, a Nigerian, an African, anybody, European, American, anybody that comes to Christ, anybody on the face of the earth, if he repents of his sin and he has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, Lord, I'm sorry, he will be forgiven. Sinners who come to Christ will have salvation. Amen. But how about sinners who do not come? They do not come to God through Jesus Christ if anyone does not come to God through Jesus Christ, can he be saved? Tell me, can he be saved? That he's committing the unpardonable sin. Here is the Savior. Here is the Messiah. Here is the one that is saved to save him. He looks at him. He says, I won't call you Savior. I won't call you Lord. I won't call you Messiah. He looks at the Savior. And he looks at him and he says, you have Beelzebub and you are a messenger of Satan. And I will not come unto you because he will not come. That's why he will not be saved. And because he rejects the Holy Ghost, he receives the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that draws us. It's the Holy Ghost that pulls us. It's the Holy Ghost that convicts us. It's the Holy Ghost that makes us feel guilty for our sin. 
but he will not allow the ministry of the Holy Ghost in his life. And he says, no, I don't want Christ. And I don't want the Holy Ghost to have any influence on me. I resist him. I reject him. And he cannot come by himself. It takes the drawing power of the Holy Ghost to bring him. But he will not come because he will not come to Christ. And he will not allow the drawing influence of the Holy Ghost upon his life. That's why he's not saved. And that is the unpardonable sin. There are those who brainwash themselves. And they despise Christ. And they will not come to Christ. They seal their own doom forever and ever. There are some people, it may be their parents brainwashing them. It may be their teachers brainwashing them. It may be their tribe brainwashing them and saying that Jesus Christ is not Savior and Jesus Christ is not Lord. And they accept that in their heart and they will not come to Christ. If they don't come to Christ, they are the people that hinder themselves from being saved. No brainwashing will stop you from Christ. No brainwashing will sever you or separate you from Christ. No brainwashing, you know, either you read in books or your neighbors say it or some people say it anywhere that you should not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will not brainwash you. You will not go to hell. They will not damn your soul. You will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever they say, there's freedom of speech. But their freedom, they may use that freedom of speech to hinder themselves from getting to heaven. They will not hinder you. They will not hinder me. The Holy Spirit draws sinners to the Savior, but blaspheming him and resisting him perpetually will hinder them from getting to heaven. God is not willing that any should perish, but those who lock themselves up in darkness, those who lock themselves up in blasphemy, those who lock themselves up in perdition, they do not have anybody to blame. If they perish, they have themselves to blame. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 40 and verse 41. Acts chapter 13, verse 40. Beware therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, despisers, those who despise the Lord Jesus Christ, and they despised his miracles, and they despised his teaching, and they despised his word. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe. That's the problem. A work, the miracles of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the teaching of Christ, coming from heaven, which they will in no wise believe, though a man declare age unto you. That's why they perished. They lodged themselves up in darkness. They locked themselves up in perdition. They locked themselves up in their damnation. Matthew chapter 13. I read from verse 15. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. For these people's heart is wax cross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Look at this. Are you there? I said, are you in verse 15? And their eyes, somebody tell me. Are you not there? And their eyes, somebody tell me out aloud. Who closed their eyes? I said, who shut their eyes? They were the people. They closed their eyes. They were seeing the light. I don't want to see the light. They don't want to see the light. And if they close their eyes, and they do not want to see the sun of righteousness, S-U-N, the sun. 
how are they going to see the light? It says, and their eyes, they are closed, lest that any time they shall see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. They die in their sickness because they say, no, I don't want, if the healing is only in Christ, I'm not going to get that healing. If the salvation is only in Christ, they don't want to get that salvation. Their eyes, they are closed so that they will not be converted and they will not be healed. That's why they remain in the unpardonable sin. Look at chapter 23 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 23, I read from verse 37. Matthew 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together? As for me, I want you saved. As for me, I want you healed. As for me, I came to call you to repentance. As for me, I want you in heaven. How often? But I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. Tell me the rest. Tell me out aloud. And you would not, you would not. They were the people that shut the door against themselves. That's why they couldn't get to heaven. Christ wanted to save them. And Christ wanted to redeem them, but they shut the door against themselves and they made themselves commit the unpardonable sin. I pray it will not happen to you. John chapter 5, we're looking at verse 40. John chapter 5, verse 40. And ye would not come to me. You see that? It's not the fault of Christ. When it says, he that speaketh blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, that's the drawing influence that draws us and leads us to Christ. It's the voice, the still small voice inside us that will say, go to Christ. Jesus is Savior. There's no salvation in any other, but that salvation you'll find in Christ. But they stifle that voice. They reject that voice. And they blaspheme that Holy Ghost. And it says, And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. They would not come that they might have life. That's why they didn't have life. You have come to Christ, you have life. You have come to Christ, you have forgiveness. You have come to Christ, you have regeneration. You love the truth, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And as you come to him, you are going to have the fullness of salvation from the Lord in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 51. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. You stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears ye do always resist the holy ghost as your fathers did so do ye ye do always resist the holy ghost that's why they couldn't be saved that's why they locked themselves up in unpardonable sin welcome to second thessalonians chapter 2 second thessalonians Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of righteousness, in them that perish, there are people who perish, they are self-deceivers. They are deluded people. And why did they perish? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The truth is made clear.
the truth is made plain but they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause for this reason god shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie you see the whole nation of israel as their priests as their high priest as the sanhedrin as their ruler said christ is not the messiah christ is not the savior eventually they believed that lie and many of them were not saved because they believed a lie now we have the bible you have old testament new testament and it's in your hand and you're coming to the bible study and you can see the truth by yourself even the evil spirit said we know you you are the christ the son of the living god and yet even though the holy uh, the evil spirit said that in the midst in front of those pharisees the pharisees still shook their head they said they will not believe what else will god do that's why they perish but you believe in the lord you will not perish verse 11 and for this cause god shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie verse 12 that they all might be damned that they all all those decided decisive unbelievers all those people that love the door of salvation against themselves all those that believed error purposefully and deliberately that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness we're coming to romans chapter 10 romans chapter 10 i read from verse 21 romans chapter 10 reading from verse 21 but to israel he says all day long have i stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people they disobeyed the word of the lord and they gainsaid that means they said no they contradicted the word of the lord and the lord stretched forth his hand for their salvation but they rejected that's why they were not saved. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I read from verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. If we sin willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth jesus christ the truth was with them and some of them came to jesus and they said we know master you speak the truth you are no respecter of persons tell us shall we pay tribute to caesar or not they said show me a coin and they showed him he said whose image and superscription is this he said of Caesar, he said, give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and unto God what belongs to God. They were marveled, they were surprised, they knew this, the teacher come from heaven. After knowing him, that he spoke the truth, he taught the truth, and he is the personification of the truth. After that, they still said something negative, willfully. Look at verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. They knew that this is a sacrifice. This is a perfect sacrifice. This is the acceptable sacrifice. They knew that salvation comes from no other except through this Jesus Christ, the Savior. They knew he committed no sin. He asked them, which of you has convinced me, convicted me of sin? Nobody could convince him of any sin. And yet, they rejected that perfect sacrifice. That's why it says, if you reject the only way, there's no other way of salvation. Verse 27, 
but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour consumer the adversaries he that despises moses law died without mercy on the two or three witnesses how of how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden on the foot the son of god what does that mean the son of god standing before them and pleading with them what will ye die o israel i have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth and yet they rejected him to the point they pushed him down and walked over him and went to perdition look at that verse 29 of how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall he be such worthy who have trodden on the foot the son of god and has counted the blood of the covenant where he was where we is he was sanctified and unholy sin a personal backslides and no falls away he was saved before he was sanctified before and now he goes about saying i don't believe all that salvation sanctification holiness without which no man shall save the lord no i don't believe and he counts the blood of jesus where we is he was sanctified in the past he counts that now an unholy thing he has done despite unto the spirit of grace the spirit that will bring grace into his life he has done despite unto him for we know him that said vengeance belongeth unto me i will recompense says the lord and again the lord shall judge his people verse 31 it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god I pray that none of us will fall into perdition in Jesus' name. The Lord calls everyone. He wants everyone to be saved. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 13. Ezekiel chapter 18. We're reading from verse 13. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one of you according to his ways says the lord god repent look at that when he said i will judge you you are sinful you are dirty you are corrupt i reject you then in that same verse he said but you know i've not ordained you to perdition i've not uh, foreordained you to perish and I've not said you must perish by all means, but I'm saying this because of your sin. And I'm a God of judgment. And I will judge you if you don't repent. But come now, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgression. So you understand, committing the unpardonable sin is not, is not coming from God. It's coming from the people because of the way they position themselves. If anyone will repent, God will forgive. I said God will forgive. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. But start at one. Cast away from you all your transgressions. Whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth says the lord god wherefore turn yourselves and leave ye you will live you'll have eternal life and god will protect you from any sin that will buy you from heaven in jesus name we come to point number three now the unprecedented status and standing of dedicated disciples disciples who dedicate themselves unto the lord see their status and see their standing we're coming to mark chapter 3 reading from verse 31 it says and, and there came then his brethren and his mother and standing without saint unto him calling him and the multitude sat about him 
And they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. Thy mother and thy brethren seek for thee. Look up here for a moment. The Lord Jesus Christ was in the business of a father. And he had said from the age of 12, What were you looking for me? Don't you know I must be about my father's business and the preaching, the teaching of the word of God. That's why he came. He was teaching people. And while he was still teaching, in the middle of that teaching, the mother was looking for him. And the brothers and sisters were looking for him. And somebody said, excuse me, uh, stop your preaching, stop your teaching. Look back there, your, fa your mother and your brethren looking for you. And Jesus said, what's my mother? Who are my brethren? I'll read the rest to you. But let's learn a lesson from this. You are praying. You are talking to the Almighty God. And you are beseeching heaven. You are knocking at the gate of heaven. And then your telephone rings. You say, Lord, excuse me, I'm coming. This one is more important. Then you pick up the phone, you answer, you talk, 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 and then you put the phone down, and then you say, God, I'm back. As I was saying, oh Lord, I'm asking for this, I'm asking for that. And before you can depend upon the promise of God, the phone rings again. I'm sorry, Lord, somebody is calling me again. This one is very important. I don't know who he is. It may be somebody more important than you are. And then you pick up the phone, you talk, talk, talk. And then after that, you come back to prayer. Is that good praying? Tell me, is that good praying? Jesus has shown us an example. While he was preaching to the people and teaching them, and you know, the mother and the brethren came he will not pay attention to that. I pray our lives will reflect the attitude of Christ in every area, in every scene, in Jesus' name. Uh, you are having a crusade. And many of us are going to preach in the crusades uh, coming on this coming Wednesday. Is that right? The Lord will bless the word in your mouth. Souls will come to the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. The anointing of God will be upon you. And the word that will drive sinners to repentance will come through you in Jesus' name. Here you are, you're preaching, and there is somebody at the back of the crowd. And that person happens to be your relative. He's not seen you for some time, and he heard that there's going to be a crusade, and he knows you might be there, and he's, uh, you know, he's, he's come to look for you. And then at the back, he's waving his hand, and he's saying, you remember? Look at me. And then summarize what you are saying, and come. Because I don't have time. I'm not going to wait till the end. And it signals to you. Will you stop? Will you go and give him attention? You'll say, it's all right. It's all right. I'm going to stop now. I'll come to you. Will you do that? You see, that's what happened here. That Jesus Christ was teaching. And then his mother and brethren were looking for him. And uh, you know, they might be offended if he didn't stop. But you didn't stop, you will not stop. I will not stop. Now I'm saying it for myself. I said, I will not stop. The Spirit of God will walk in your life. The power of God will walk in your life. Look at verse 33. And he answered them saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, verse 35, for whosoever, whosoever, a Gentile, Greek, Jew, whosoever, a man, a woman, whosoever, somebody in the first century, somebody in the 20th, 21st century, somebody then or somebody today, whosoever, somebody who has been a great sinner, 
But now he comes, he repents, and he calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm asking for your mercy, forgive me, whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. That's the status we have. That's the standing we have. If we do the will of a father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 7. I read from verse 21. Matthew chapter 7. We're reading from verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Repentance, that's his will. Whoso doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Getting converted, getting saved, and living the righteous life, and walking in the light, that's the will of the Father. Whoso will do the will of my Father who is in heaven, that's my mother, my brother, and my sister. Sanctification, holiness, is the will of God. And Jesus said, whosoever will do the will of God, that's my brother, that's my sister, and that's my mother. You'll do the will of God. Second Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It tells us, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and i will be their god and they shall be my people look at the will of god who is in heaven wherefore come out from among them and be separate says the lord touch not the unclean thing and i will receive you and ye shall and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and my daughters brothers and sisters so the lord jesus christ says the lord Almighty, that's the will of God that you come out of sin. That's the will of God that you come out from among the sinners and live a life that shows the grace of God. Chapter 7, verse 1. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, cleanliness in the spirit, cleansing of the soul cleansing of the heart that's the will of God and Jesus said whosoever will do the will of my father who is in heaven that's my brother that's my sister that's my mother it says to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God perfecting holiness in the fear of God I come into Romans chapter 8. I read from verse 14. Doing the will of God. And then will become the children of God, brothers and sisters to the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They don't give the Spirit of God. They are led by the Spirit of God. They don't resist the Spirit of God. They are led by the Spirit of God. They do not blaspheme the Spirit of God. They are led by the Spirit of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the Spirit of bondage again to fear. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, 
and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer the suffering persecution, we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You'll be glorified with him in Jesus' name. Do so do the will of God. They're my brother, they're my sister, they're my mother. In John, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I read from verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away. And the laws thereof, but he that doeth the will of God. Remember what Jesus said? Anyone and those who do the will of God, that's my brother, that's my sister, and my mother. And he says here, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You will abide forever. You will do the will of God. First John chapter 3, I read from verse 8. First John chapter 3, reading from verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. That's not a brother to Christ. That's not a sister to Christ. That's not a child of God. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. You will not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, Neither he that loveth not his brother. If there's hatred in your heart, you're not a brother to Jesus, you're not a sister to Jesus, there must be love in the heart, love for him, love for the truth, love for the church, and love for the brethren. First John chapter 4, verse 17. First John chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. The Lord will perfect your love. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Listen to this. Because as he is, so are we in this world. As he did the will of the Father, and he did the will of the Father joyfully, cheerfully, promptly, in the same way, we do the will of the Father cheerfully, joyfully, and promptly. Our brothers and sisters to the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. Christ did everything the Father wanted him to do without any complaint and without murmuring and without disputing. He did it cheerfully, happily. Let's do the same thing here. You know, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the watch of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We will not labor in vain. I will not labor in vain. 
laboring over you to get saved and to be sanctified and to be filled with the Holy Ghost and to be in the center of the will of God. All the desires of God and my desires will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. I will not labor upon you in vain. And you will not labor upon your local church or house fellowship or your converse. You will not labor in vain in Jesus' name. God is your Father. Christ is your Savior. And you do the will of God. And you are going to abide forever in Jesus' name. John chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 17. John chapter 20. Verse 17, Jesus says unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father. Jesus said, You are my disciple, you are my brethren, you have been saved, you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, we have the same Father. I ascend to my Father and your Father. I ascend to my God and your God. I believe that as the Lord has revealed all this to us, we we'll live in the will of God in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 29. For whom he did for no he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the will of God. He wants you and I to be conformed to the image of his only begotten son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Whatever remains to be done in your heart, in our hearts, so that we can be bona fide children of God, brothers and sisters and brethren of Christ, he will do it even from tonight in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I read from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2. We're reading from verse 9. But we we'll see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God he might taste death for every man he tasted your death he went to the cross he died for you and because he died for you whosoever will call on his name will be saved if you come to the Lord and say Lord I know that you took my death I know you bore my punishment. I believe on you. You'll be saved in Jesus' name. Verse 10, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. That's his will. He wants to bring you to glory. He wants to bring all the grace and the godliness that you ought to have. He wants you to have that so he can bring you to glory. And he says to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Verse 11, for both he that sanctifies, he has power to sanctify. He has the grace to sanctify. And he will sanctify every one of us in Jesus' name. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. We belong to the same God, to the same Father, to the same kingdom. We are all of one. And he says, for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. To call them brethren. To call them brethren. Are you part of the brethren of Jesus Christ? I'm asking somebody there, are you part of the brethren of Jesus Christ? The Lord confirm it in heaven in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 12, I read from verse 49. Matthew chapter 12, verse 49. Matthew chapter 12, verse 49. And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, 
for whosoever shall do the will of my father which is in heaven the same is my brother my sister and mother the lord is looking at you from heaven he's stretching forth his hand unto you that has to come to do the fullness of the will of the father you are a child of god say amen a brother to the lord jesus christ say amen a sister to the lord jesus say amen as jesus prayed and the father answered him is the first begotten and we are brothers and sisters of christ and sons and daughters of god as you pray god will answer your prayer make up your mind every moment every day every challenge whatever comes i will stay at the center of doing the will of god and you'll forever abide in his word and when the trumpet shall sound and the saints of god and the sons and the daughters of god will go marching in thank god i will be there thank god you will be there and the lord will take us to heaven at his own time when that takes place in jesus name all the grace we need all the strength we need all the abiding power and uh, all the abiding godliness and virtue we need the lord will give to every one of us in jesus name let's rise up now and call upon the name of the lord and tell the lord we have heard today what you have uh, taught us and revealed in your word remember a divided house cannot stand a divided family will not stand a divided kingdom will not stand a divided church will not stand and uh, tell the lord he'll make you he'll make you an instrument of unity an instrument of peace an instrument of progress an instrument of purity tell the lord in yourself if you're divided your heart is saying something your head is saying another thing your head is saying something your hand is acting the other way that's insanity tell the lord you're not going to allow insanity in your own personality you're going to be united in your body united with your brain united with your mind united with your soul united all through you within and without if you are married united with your wife if you are married united with your husband if you are children of the father and you're still living in, in the home united with your parents unity is very important you are a member of the church you are united you are one you want to retain that unity if we're pulling right pull right don't pull the opposite direction whatever direction we're going following that same direction there's strength in unity there's power in unity and there is progress in unity a divided church cannot stand and remember don't lock yourself against salvation don't lock the door of salvation against yourself because if you resist the Holy Ghost, if you reject the Holy Ghost, and if you stubbornly uh, become stiff-necked against the Holy Ghost, are you going to remain saved? Be yielded, be submissive under the mighty hand of the Lord, and say, Lord, here am I. I submit to the drawing influence of the Holy Ghost. I'll be in the center of doing the will of God and abide in doing the will of God. And so when the trumpet shall sound, I will not be found missing. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord before you go.